Let's bring up Tony Diaz and get a round of applause. Thank you. They're a little wobbly. This is the best we can do. <laughs> um, okay, so hey, he's kind of the. He's, I kind of make everybody be a guinea pig. I don't really tell them what we're doing. I just said, "Hey, come sit in a chair, and we'll ask you a bunch of questions." So uh, the usual format is we're going to go through how you started, you know, why you do it now, and kind of the model, then uh, ask audience questions. So. Uh, why real estate? Why 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 did you get in this business? Um, at about 16 years old, my parents um, had already been in business doing loans and real estate for a couple of years, and they decided to buy their first house. And uh, on my weekends, and they would make me go out and change toilets and paint houses. So that was my intro. <laughs> um, that sounds fun. Oh, a lot of fun. Uh, previewing that was a lot of fun as well. <laughs> so that's I kind of got forced into it. So. So then, so your family was in real estate for a generation before you. Pretty much, yeah. So when were they buy and hold or flip or what do they typically do? Uh, my mom was a typical real estate agent. My dad was doing the loans. Um, so they did get into the rehab and and that was how I got into it. Was it uh, here in California? Or where was yeah, that just at? still in California, uh, mostly the Inland Empire. Oh, so I you've been here a long time. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so that's so where my backyard. Long. Okay. Yeah, we we were just joking about it a minute ago. Like, if you ha if you didn't start here, why would you come here? Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Takes up with a ridiculous amount of opportunity <laughs> still. Uh, okay. So, family got you into here. What was the first deal you did on your own? Uh, 18 years old. I picked up a house in uh, Rialto up in Mariposa, uh, 43,000. Uh, the uh, owner had uh, gotten evicted by um, health department. <laughs> It, there's no toilet on the house, right? <laughs> so you can imagine there's a bucket, oh and man. they use the uh, garbage disposal to process things. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was my first one, yeah. So <laughs> you can, no one ever forgets the first one. Right. I remember. It. Always fun. What was the what was the worst thing that happened in the first deal? Um, <laughs> well, of course I was gonna save all this money because I was gonna do all the work myself, <laughs> right? <laughs> So <laughs> just going out there and fixing the drywall, which is kind of interesting, going in and fixing each hole individually, putting the tape and <laughs> <laughs> instead of ripping out the whole drywall. Uh, it took me about three months to fix the house. Um, of course, I didn't sell. At that time, I was already in real estate, so I lost three months' worth of business. I probably saved about $2,000 worth of labor, so it made a lot of sense, <laughs> right? Oh, man. <laughs> but, yeah, it, it was a good experience to learn what not to do. How did you buy it? Did you finance it or family put up the money? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a little bit of my money. And then uh, actually one of my best friend's uh, parents lent us the rest. So. Oh, sweet. So you were sort of syndicating capital right. from the there very beginning. Well, I didn't know now. that, but yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you, you just asked for money. You don't realize you're actually doing That's something right, with exactly. it. Uh, okay, so first you went through the first deal and it was like, were you just hooked? That was it? You were, you were in, you were, uh, I mean, I guess you started in it. So was the intention just this is what I'm going to do going forward? You was in the family? Um, you know, the opportunity, uh, you know, commission, uh, at that time, b I started back in 94, uh, like I said, 18 years old, everybody was telling me it was a bad market, I, I just knew I had to do X amount of calls and things like that to make $150,000 commission, and I realized that uh, the, the flips made a lot more sense, okay. so I just didn't have the capital, though, so. Yeah, and it's, it's a little more reliable than hoping. Like, we're, I was just talking about this other day about hoping that maybe somebody will buy a house. Like, right. I don't like to gamble, right. so I don't I, I don't want to pick up the phone 100 times and maybe get exactly. a yes. So then you continued that for a series of years. So that was 94. It's a good time to buy. So right. you made it through the, I guess, well, all the way through 2006, right? And we had a s little slowdown, but in 2000, that was it, right? You just kept right. kind of raising the stakes all the way through then? That's right. We actually got uh, pushed out of the uh, uh, flip market. Uh, we started buying land in field development. Uh, I figured since we knew how to flip them, we can f build them, right? <laughs> it's another learning curve. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Why not so try something new? <laughs> we ended up buying a house, uh, actually a, a track or, or uh, 10 consecutive lots out in Big Bear. Easy place to build. So Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, it, it was fun. Uh, we learned a lot. The... Uh, the economy really helped us kind of wipe 
all our problems yeah, away. Yeah, whoops. Oh, like no problem. <laughs> so we ended up breaking even. So it was great for uh, first <laughs> 10 <laughs> homes. <laughs> hey, if you don't lose money on the first one, you're doing good, right? That's right. That's, that's right. what everybody says. So that got you into development. Did you continue to do development after that, or what happened? Yeah, we, we, uh, that was our first experience. One of my things that I take pride is learning from our mistakes. Uh, we realized we had the wrong contractor. We had the, the wrong staff. And we just took our experience and tried it again a little bit bigger, a little bit better, build a little bit more processes to it, used a lot better quality people, and just started growing. And, and, and just using the right people always seemed to be our, our, our key to growth. So did what were you doing when the uh, the music stopped in 2006 <laughs> or 7? I can or actually eight. tell you exactly what happened. Yeah, <laughs> I remember the day too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> March, uh, first uh, Monday uh, of March, I walk into my – at that time, we have four uh, projects going. Uh, B of A was our lender. I walk in. Everything was sold over 10 times. We're walking away and closing deals. And quite honestly, sometimes I kind of feel bad <laughs> how much money we're making make, yeah. <laughs> per deal. Um, and uh, my lender says, hey, uh, they don't have any more stated, stated programs. And I said, don't worry. Sell it to the other 48 people that are waiting for the house. <laughs> um, six months later, we had uh, gone foreclosed. <laughs> And uh, I ended up short selling the houses, uh, stayed with the lender, uh, closed out the transaction or, or the uh, build out for them. And uh, to this day, I have them as my re best reference. I tell people that my best reference is somebody that lost a million dollars doing business with me. So it's <laughs> amazing how that works, isn't right? it? If you stick around. Yeah. So, so th was that the day New Century went under? The day, the essentially, the day the whole subprime just collapsed. Yeah, well, th that was the start. Um, yeah. So we started, it took us um, probably about a year to crash land. Um, and at that point, uh, there was really nothing for us to do. The flip market wasn't there for us. Uh, and uh, that's when I started actually, I became a volunteer for the nonprofit. Uh, like for I said, I had for Homestrong? For Homestrong, okay. right. Yep. I was doing a lot of infield development for them in the past. Knew Jed Davis, who's the uh, CEO of the company, great or organization. And I went to him and said, listen, I'm, I don't know what to do. Um, you know, uh, and he says, listen, I can't pay you, but become a volunteer and uh, good things came from that. So <laughs> can you kind of tell everybody a little bit about what Homestrong does? Sure. Uh, Homestrong is a national nonprofit. They specialize in uh, foreclosure prevention, real foreclosure prevention. They are HUD approved. Uh, they help a lot of people. Um, I actually became a HUD certified counselor myself. And uh, they also have a really good program. It's a, a home... I forgot the actual name, but they actually d they donate homes to uh, veterans. Uh, they fix them really nice. They put them out to the market. They put out they're put out to a panel, and the panel decides who gets that property. I, mean, I remember hearing about that. I can't think of the name offhand either. So, Homestrong is exceptionally good at outbidding regular investors <laughs> <laughs> by like a just mile, hmm. um, because they work on a on a model that that is. It's a nonprofit, so spreads are essentially gone with the exception of contractor bids and whatever. I don't know that you know more of the intricacies of the intricacies of the back end. I just know when I got a phone call from the agent when I was bidding on a property for a hedge fund, mm -hmm. and I was on a four percent margin, thought no one can beat us, and then I got well, Homestrong's in ten thousand over you, and I'd lose my mind. Yeah, it, it's uh, city funds. Yeah. So uh, they have to spend them. Uh, I don't know if you guys know that the, the government or the cities get a couple million dollars, and if they don't spend it, they get taken away. So uh, in most cases, there's a small loss or they carry back seconds, uh, but the nonprofits make essentially a management fee. So so what was the, uh, the, the appraisal process like? I know that was a big key component of that on the purchases of those. As far as the uh, on our acquisition side, or uh, yeah, I know with the with the NSP funds, the neighbor right. it's, the, it's called the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Right. There was an appraiser or some kind of uh, valuation required on the front. I I'd never seen what those are like. What was that like? It, it was bank specific. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the the uh, the back end logic was, but uh, what they were trying to do is establish a market price so they wouldn't hit the the market because in certain cases. Um, and I don't know if you know this or not, but the price that we're paying had a discount from the back end. Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah, so okay. it was given a discount. Uh, I in general, it was very well known through all the nonprofits. Uh, and the way they did it is they set up a price. Let's just say the house is 100000 And we were given a discount in escrow of $20,000. So we oh. recorded at 100 Okay. And then so they took the loss. Correct. 
Okay, so, so is or it, CRA uh, credit. So it's a number pl- a numbers play. Something like that. Okay, so you so you guys, I mean, when when you're making the offer, the the the, the bank or the owner, whoever in this case, is still getting their full their full bump, except there's a discount somewhere. Well, I mean, uh, from an investor perspective, there's a certain amount of dollar you you were gonna pay 80, 80 cents or eighty thousand yeah. for a hundred thousand. We were basically paying the same price at e- eighty thousand. Uh, the margins for the nonprofit were generally fairly low. Sure. But uh, depending on the city or who they're working with, they were given uh, s- uh, subsidies and things like that. So at the end of the day, um, they're making, again, a, a percentage fee. Were there, um, I mean, other than the making the homes, uh, you know, livable and good condition for an end user, was there any, like, uh, green built standards you attached to or anything like that? No, it just, uh, it was very, uh, it wasn't cost effective. Uh, yeah. We looked into a whole bunch of different models. Um, obviously, the, the easy one is the solar, the credits, and things like that. It just at the end, uh, most of the people that are looking to buy these properties are payment conscious, and they wanted to make sure they got the best payment possible. So the you know triple pane windows weren't as, as important. You know? Sure, triple so pane. <laughs> <laughs> so. Absolutely for kitchens. Oh yeah, uh, I seen that too. So <laughs> you seen it, you yeah. seen it come out? So really, that's awesome. So uh, yeah, Homestrong is a branch. Now, can you kind of give everybody a uh, ten thousand foot all encompassing view of what you do now? Sure. Uh, like I said, we've been buying twenty one years now. Uh, our experience uh, has helped us build systems. We are a system driven company. Uh, we're structured. We have really good staff, and uh, right now our goal is t- uh, we're buying about 15 properties uh, per month. Um, we are h- here based out of Rancho Cucamonga. We buy all over Southern California, and our a- average price purchase in the 350 range. We do stay away from anything that is complicated, meaning build outs, major permit issues, and things like that. We've done them in the past. Uh, but uh, in most cases, I'm here. I'm sure you guys know that investors are looking for a particular return, 20% return. I won't touch anything less than 15. We're looking at more of the overall. We're getting in. We're getting out very, very quickly. Uh, we have a process as far as our rehabs, and it allows us to be very efficient. Um, we price them well, and we're really watching our, our opportunity costs, not so much our expense of money. Right. And it allows us to move the money about four times again. So. What do, you, what do you mean by opportunity cost? So if you're, say you've got $100,000 and you go out and purchase a property and uh, you're looking for an additional $10,000 and you're going to send the market an extra month, by the time you realize that you're only flipping that money instead of four times a year, it's three times, so you're going to make 30% return on a yearly basis if you're making 10% average per flip. Mm-hmm. If you're getting in quicker, you're going to make 40%. Okay. So that yeah. makes sense. Is it, um, is it, are you working, I don't know how much detail you can give on your capital structure, but are you working with like leveraged funds or what's your capital structure look like? Yeah, no, we're, we're leveraged. Uh, we use uh, a, a combination of hard money and a private small investor that uh, does our equity position. Uh, we get very good rates and uh, high leverage because of our experience. So you have a uh, hard money first and a essentially private investor second and then you guys are sharing the piece on the, the small portion the you you, you I explain this I don't want to want to get too technical and say sure. capital <laughs> stack and that right, kind of right. so essentially you, you're combining two types of financing to get a lower overall cost of financing and correct. then looking at the opportunity cost That's correct. Okay. so we we don't invest any capital out of pocket absolutely Oh, so w- then you in turn your returns really infinite then? Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like a lot of I've heard a lot of guys say that, you know, oh, I only made ten percent or only I made eight percent, but really your only cost is the cost of operation. So Correct. as long as the company as a whole is making X amount of dollars, it's always profitable using outside capital. Right, yeah, I mean we we are uh, staff. W- w- our overhead is pretty heavy. Is it? So the f- a good percentage of our our profit goes to the um, you know to the staff and overhead and things like that. But um, it allows us to be extremely efficient and good at what we do. So well it's scalable more than, than anything. I was going to say, you said you essentially try and, like, we always talk about trying to fire ourselves. Like, you right, try right. and fire yourself on a regular basis. So you rely right. on your staff pretty heavily. That's right. 
Um, wh one of the uh, a book I read, and I, I saw your recommendations there, uh, probably about five years ago, ago is called The E-Myth. Has anybody read it, The E-Myth? It's a phenomenal book, if you haven't read it. So uh, the, the concept of the book is understanding your role in the company. Um, there's a technician, there's a manager, and there's an entrepreneur. And we do the mistake of being everything. Uh, we try to run our company, but we're still going to go to Home Depot, and we're going to try to do our books. And this book explained it, it opened my eyes to the fact that I can't be everything. I need to have the right people. And um, as of uh, six months ago, um, one of my CEO coaches uh, through Vistage, a great organization, uh, pretty much made me quit my company, uh, which is the best thing I've done. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, the point was to make sure that the company ran without me. And uh, it's been great. I have another uh, venture that I've been working on, but the fact that I can do about 15 properties a month not have to go out and see anything and be profitable. Uh, it's all due to systems and processes, good staff. And uh, I, I'll tell you, it's uh, uh, being here, it, 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 I'm very proud of my staff because not only do they do a good job, uh, but they're also an intricate part of building this process. So it's a lot, a lot of work and a lot of fun. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, but that's kind of why we, you know, a lot of people in the room, probably why they get here in, in the first place, right? It's Everybody says it's the money, but it's the lifestyle. Right. It's Absolutely. being able to essentially fire yourself from your job. And, um, you know, some people really love real estate. I, one of my favorite parts of real estate is gutting the house, right, right. And, and, and designing it. But when you do it to scale, I mean, it's, there's just no way you can do every job. Right. right. And so, so do you have I, – I, can we, I guess I kind of want to go into intricacies, not, not too deep, but uh, do you divide everything up into, like, a you know interior designer contractor. What's the, what's the divide kind of look like on a on a flip? W we uh, we have very specific roles at the company, and we make sure that these people are able to handle. It's all broken down to um, a very detailed process on all the way from the acquisition to the construction. Uh, we have you seen one of my rehabs. You've seen them all. It's the same thing over and over. We have variations of product depending on the quality and the finish. Uh, but ultimately, we created a, a rubber stamp of being able to build the same house over and over and over. Uh, we don't get into the high-end stuff, and it allows us to have a, a process and a way to, if it fits the box, we keep it. If it doesn't, it gets all, uh, sold to other investors. So do you have a like a high, medium, and low rehab? Correct. Something like that? So okay. So you're like, this one is never in a million years going to sell for more than X. We're doing the cheap one. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, on the given that, I, I, I want to make a point that nothing's ever a pile of crap if you do the cheap one. Do you have processes in place to sort of make sure on this on the exit that the the buyer is getting a good end product? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things that we had problems, especially when we were doing at one point with the nonprofit, thirty properties a month. Uh, we grew very fast. The bank started just dumping properties at us, and and one of the most frustrating things is having a product where you have a buyer that's asking just for basic stuff, but also the appraiser. It's a waste of our money, a waste of everybody's time. The contractor loses money. So the quality control to us is extremely important, obviously from a safety perspective, but more importantly, you want to have a good product out there and, and something you're proud of. We talked about you know, the, the, the business. Uh, once you get used to it and once you understand that you have to have a purpose for it, and, and to me, they're little trophies. They're the you go home and we did a good job. Somebody has a nice home. They're s they're safe and, and they're proud of you it. Have, so. Do you have kids now? I have one daughter. Yes. Okay, how old is she? Fourteen, fifteen now. Do you ever do the? I bought that house <laughs> last last year and we did this and bought she's that like, one I, twice. Yeah, and she could care less. She's like, oh, she care. oh God, she, why? I'm doing that. I'm doing to my daughter what my mom did. To right, me. that house is worth it. And see the neighbor. Right. Yeah. I'm drag my daughter's tan, and I'm doing the same thing. I drag her around into properties, make her inspect it with me. That's right. She opens the door on a Saturday. She says, "You're not gonna say make me go see." <laughs> <laughs> she cracks it on the oh way yeah, out. She does. I have plans. That's right. <laughs> so, um, the everybody wants you know about seventy percent of the audience is you know newer. Um, you know, a lot of people complain they're struggling to find deals. I think that's why I really decided to do the thirty ways to find a deal next month. Um, you're looking at, you know, your volume, turnkey. If you were a, you know, probably everybody asks this question, if you're the, a newer investor today, what's your, what's your suggested model look like, you think? 
So our, we buy 60% uh, of our properties we buy because of relationship. Um, as you guys know, if it's a property that's off the market, it's a little bit cleaner deal. You don't have to get pushed on prices as often. Uh, I, I highly recommend you find out who your local agents that are doing business. Uh, I'm sure most of you guys have MLS access, or if you don't, figure out who is double ending their properties, who's not double ending their properties. That will tell you whether if you're going to waste your time or not. And it just find a good CRM system, follow through. Uh, doesn't hurt to go meet people face to face. Uh, these events are great. We do get a lot of uh, deals from people that uh, th maybe. Uh, they buy two, three a year, they can't do enough, and they pass them. So network and uh, follow through to, to us is, is key in relationship. Do you, do you ever push, I, I've talked to new, new investors about this premise, but do you ever push the, the idea of go out and tell everybody you can buy anything because if you can't pick it up, we can? Um, it, no, because I think you build a, a false sense of what a deal is, and people start just putting de deals together, they're not going to work. Sure. So to us, the relationship with the agents is more important. One of the, and kind of back to the previous questions, um, to us, when we approach a realtor, it's not about uh, the deals, it's about the relationship. Uh, and if you approach it that way, you're going to get a little different appro different answers. Uh, when that agent that's doing five transactions a year gets that one transaction that's an opportunity, yeah. they're hearing from us and a whole bunch of other people and you know, we have a good pitch. <laughs> so they're going to hear a good story. They're not going to pay attention to you because everybody's telling the same thing. You don't want to get them when they don't have, when they have that deal. You want to get them when they don't. So when they do get the deal, they're going to call you first. And that's worth gold, guys. You just relationships is everything. So, you know, in back in 2009, 2010, everybody said REO, REO, get, get right. to know the REO agents. You know, now we're seeing surprise in New York, which is a lot of, uh, standard sales, right. you know, random deals like, you know, parents are going into a, you know, senior care facility or uh, random a hoarder house or whatever. You know, how are you, how are you just casting as wide a net as possible or how are you choosing agents you network with? Uh, it, <coughs> we find who's, who's doing enough deals for us to build a strong relationship. Um, we have, uh, CRM systems that allows us to follow up. And uh, we have five uh, what we call the offer negotiators in houses. People spend all day long in relationships and following properties. Uh, we make sure that uh, the people that are worth going out there and buying lunch, we get out there. And ultimately, um, we just got to knock on doors. It's a numbers game. It really is. Do you, do you guys have a, um, you know, I, I know writing an offer is a lengthy process. Do you guys have a shortened version of that? It's automated? Uh, we actually have about, uh, and less and less, uh, we're having to have the agent double end, uh, but we actually send the listing agent offer terms. There's other investors, a friend of ours, that like to write up their own offers, so there's different variations, and, and I think um, – to us, and the way it works is we have the listing agent double in the property. Okay. In many cases, if there's enough uh, uh, fat in the deal, we'll give them the listing back as long as there's no conflict because of a short sell or if they don't want to disclose to the seller, we don't we, – it's just not worth it for us. So do you do you f offer um, – is, is, is your offer reflected on the entry and exit? So for example, um, if you – I've looked at, you know, some people look at commission as a part of the deal. Right. So if the agent double ends, I offer less. If the agent wants to listen on the other side, I offer less, and so on and so on right. and so on. It's that yeah, structure. Yeah, just, we have to – we don't care about the um, – if the agent's making a ton of money, good for them. We just have to make our margin. Yeah, That's absolutely. All that matters. Yeah, I, I, I was helping some newer buyers go through that same process, which showing them kind of – you just don't worry about the how much the agent's making. Right. Just sort of adjust your offer accordingly. Focus on your pie. <laughs> okay, so essentially relationships are how you guys you guys handle or you get most of your deals. Um, I know you guys have a kind of a wholesale network where you, right. you unload properties as well. Uh, give an example of, of a property that you would typically wholesale that you don't want to buy. So as I mentioned, our goal is to get in as fast as possible. Uh, we have limitations uh, because of our contractors. Uh, 
the contractors that are very well skilled and they know what they're doing, they're going to take a lot of your money. So the type of contractor we utilize is, is uh, uh, it's an owner operator. Um, we help them out through a technology process that we have so they keep themselves organized. Uh, but we, these guys are only doing about two to three a month uh, for us. So we have about four or five guys that we work with. We really watch uh, what we can or can't do. And that allows us to be able to move very s smoothly. All our properties, uh, in general, we're always on, uh, on, well, most of the time, we uh, sometimes we go over budget, but it's things that you can't Sure, predict. it happens. Uh, the type of stuff that we'd sell is when we have uh, historical overlays, uh, where we have uh, big permit issues, where the uh, ideal investment is to add a bedroom. And not that they're bad deals, they're just, we want in, we want out, we want simple, and, and that's what works for us. And what? And do you guys actually acquire and resell, or how do you wholesale? Uh, it depends on the transaction. Short sales, we take them down. We do a, what we call the development partner agreement. They, uh, we hold title. We have a, a attorney contract that spells out everybody's um, uh, uh, responsibilities, and then ultimately pass it down after 30 days, or if they don't want to restart the. 120 day clock, they have us hold us, um, hold it back. We try to s assign some of those properties in escrow, but uh, as, I, as I mentioned, our relationship to the agents is very important. So when we go out and say, hey, we're buying, if they're not comfortable tr um, assigning the name, we just keep it on their name, close it, double escrow it at the back end. And so everything's always bought under the same entity and then you sell it off or you do the wholesale assignment. Right. Exactly. And some people have talked about you know, creating individual trust and LLCs and whatever to try and, you know, sort of be able to unload the trust and it ends up being a really expensive experience. Right. Have you have you ever ran into that or tried to do that? Uh, yeah, we, we've tried. Uh, I think we're pretty creative. Uh, and uh, we've always, we have great attorneys. We pass everything through them. And, you know, I think we're more creative than we need to sometimes. Uh, simple works best. Just Absolutely. You know, and and it, it, it's hard to explain to a new investor, hey, listen, when you're really taking over the, the stock and this and that, it just... Yeah, difficult. they just lose <laughs> their mind. <laughs> right. <laughs> so going forward, you know, you got you got the current model. How, how long do you... And I don't want you to predict the market. Sure. Um, so when the time comes, when everybody says, okay, it's not really profitable, margins are too thin, we're unsure of the market, um, what's sort of the next step? Um, I do enjoy the, um, the higher-end deals uh, where you're taking down a house, uh, the more complicated deals. And I think as the uh, simple flips go away, I think you have to evolve to that type of investor, as I have done in the past, where uh, we started ha having to buy land. Uh, I really enjoy construction. Uh, I'm a little scared of it because uh, last go around was, uh, <laughs> was, a little hairy. It was tough. Um, but uh, I think that's a nat natural prog progression for us. Uh, we do have a lot of that experience, so it's not going to be as difficult as last time before. And, and we do enjoy it. Uh, we're not geared for that right now, uh, but it's, uh, it's really the same thing if you look at it, as long as you have the right people understand the, the entitlement process. Uh, I've always believed that new construction, I'd rather do 50 homes on a track than 25 rehabs. Really? Yeah, a lot easier. Is it simple? Yeah, you're building the same house over and over and over and over and over. Yeah, I guess. You get building 10 next to right, each other exactly. and you just move on. Right, that right. makes total yep, sense. Yep, yep. So that, I mean, that's obviously a much more complicated structure for anybody new. I mean, you have right. to have a little bit of, uh, you know, dirt under your boots to get through that process. Yeah, it, it, it's tough. It, it took us a lot of time, as I mentioned. Our first project, uh, we br broke even after two years. Um, it, it was... Uh, very expensive for us to learn, but again, we, we took that, uh, that that experience and we moved on and, and uh, we started using the right architect, the right contractor, and not the numbers that I wanted to hear, but the numbers that made sense and we shopped it around and just ultimately uh, not worried so much about what the contractor was, was going to make, but what was going to get our project done in time, in budget, with proven people. So, so somebody, if somebody's in this room and they have a deal today, um, I think I you have you have a you have a deal submission form on your website. That's correct. Right. Okay, right. so people well people tend to ask when we have we have speakers up here that buy a lot of property. How do I get a hold of them? How do I send their info? So you have on your website a just straight deal submission form. Right. So um, can I give out the website? Yeah, give yeah, out so the website. Yeah, absolutely. So it's investnotic, 
So invest, N-O-T-I-C. Uh, there's a submission form there. It goes directly to one of our acquisitions uh, guys. Uh, we're very fast at getting back. Uh, we do a whole bunch of combinations. We'll buy it right. Uh, if you're a realtor, we'll obviously have you double-ended. If there's enough in the on, on the on the deal, we'll have you relist at the back end. We do a really nice product. Uh, if you're an investor uh, and you have, you can't buy that particular deal. Like I said, we don't care how much you're making. I'll give you a purchase price. If you make a hundred grand on it, good for you. Uh, we just, I'm working on a deal that the guy is going to make about two hundred thousand um, dollars, and it, and he he barely bought the property, and I'm going to assume it. So I'm. I'm Good for him, right? So yeah, good for, good for him. He negotiated a good right. deal. We're gonna do okay with it, but uh, ultimately, uh, again, w sometimes when you have to, s uh, uh, when you're purchasing a property, and you need to assign it where it's difficult, or you don't want the documents in escrow because your seller is just, or the agent, you don't have that relationship. Invoices outside, we'll pay you. Not an issue. Like I said, we don't care how much you're making. Uh, bring us deals. We do JVs as well. Uh, we're very creative. Uh, we have great systems and we're very transparent so if somebody's new they don't have the experience um, we do have a way to be able to give you not, not a mentorship program uh, it's kind of a hey watch us we'll have a process follow it we have you do uh, property inspections physically drive the comps and really take part and have a vested interest in the deal and we rely on your information we pr put it through our system and our process and this way you start understanding what's the critical points that we look for. How do we streamline processes? How do we outsource things? Um, for example, inspections, BPLs, and things like that. And what information is important to have in-house and not rely on third-party people? So we do a combination of everything. Uh, but we do not mentor guys. We don't, if somebody's just saying, hey, I just, you know, here's some money, learn. It just, we're a process-driven company. We yeah, just your, par your JV partner, right, you're exactly, out of the deal. Exactly. So when, um, I'm sure you get a lot of odd submissions. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, you know, that's why people have that job. Right, right. Does, uh, you, know, you see you have a couple people kind of fielding that? Uh, yeah, we do. Uh, we're actually, uh, um, <laughs> we, I did a, a video, 15-minute video. Uh, I don't recommend you watch. It's kind of boring. <laughs> 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 but it's my way of teaching somebody how to evaluate a deal. It is on our website under the, um, uh, our acquisition tab, and uh, it's it just a way for us to explain, you know, the purchase, the, the resale, our cost, the money, and, and a brief evaluation, and um, we have a little calculator, uh, similar, not as uh, fancy as yours. Uh, fancy, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, we threw it together it in a day. <laughs> <laughs> it allows us to be able to give somebody a, a good understanding of what we're looking for. So sometimes agents send us a deal. Um, we grab it. We evaluate it. We send it back to him with a really nice report. W we know right away it's not a deal, but again, that person took time to send something. We're going to respect that time that they okay. put in, and we're going to let them know, hey, that the deal doesn't work. We try to bring them into the office if they're a high-value uh, agent, and uh, we actually say, hey, this is how we do it. This is what we're looking for. They really appreciate it, and most people that are doing 20-plus transactions a year uh, – have a de decent understanding of what a transaction is. Is the newer agents or, or guys that are not doing as much? Um, those are the type of relationships that uh, also uh, work very well for us, and we're happy to spend the time with them to teach them or or, or to answer any questions. So yeah, it's, those are the ones that you hope to, I guess, grow up and yeah, build exactly. a relationship exactly. over time. It's exactly. like politics, yeah. right? You got to get yeah, them while right, they're right. young. <laughs> exactly. So uh, I know you got this video on there. I watched the video. Okay. I saw the 15 <laughs> minutes of it. Was it painful? It wasn't <laughs> that bad. I was like, this makes sense. That <laughs> makes sense. At this the base level that I told you. Because we, we've been talking about doing a, uh, like a due diligence talk. Right. Do these things so you don't make mistakes. Right. So um, when, when a deal comes through, what, do you, what kind of homework do you have expect the person to have done? From the agent side? From the agent side? Um, not much. Uh, we don't rely on anybody's information. Uh, I'm sure you guys come across deals from uh, wholesalers that you got a rehab price and a sales price. I mean, the, the reality is you have to do your homework. Uh, so we take that, it just we run it through the process. It goes into our system. We evaluate it. Um, 
and depending on the uh, if we have a, a good opportunity we physically send people out to see the house depending on the type of property if it's a little bit more complicated we send in-house contractors if they are um, if it's a simple rehab we just send somebody's going to give us some pictures and a decent description, and we outsource that. Um, but um, in general, you, it takes us maybe five, six hours to be able to physically see a house, get back, and have a non no contingency offer if we have to. That's pretty fast. Yeah, we, we have some. And, and we have, have people out in you know Ventura that are local. When I call them, they're, they're out there really quickly instead of us sending our poor guy in. Yeah. No, I need, to right I need to outsource <laughs> some inspection, so I'm going to hit you up afterwards. But it's a good way to do it. Five what? Five minutes? All right. All right let's g I wanted to get some questions, but I, I keep rambling on. Um, well, all right, since I got the five-minute warning, we'll just kind of halt it there.